Welcome to the Secure Connections podcast brought to you by IOTSA, the Internet of Things Security Services Association. As always, I'm Brian Sherman, Content Director for IOTSA and host of our weekly discussions. My special guest today is Jason Norton, Product Marketing Director for Viper Security. We plan to discuss why email is king and how money, mayhem, and madness factor into the cybersecurity mix. Welcome to the Secure Connections podcast, Jason. Hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, really a uh, pleasure to be here. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to too. I know uh, you're down in Florida in the mix of things right now with uh, with the pandemic and everything. So uh, I hope everybody is doing well and uh, as best they can, at least in, in this time. It, yeah, hanging in there. Um, as most people have seen, Florida is uh, you know kind of one of the hot spots, but uh, we're managing it the best we can. Uh, you know, personally, I've been working uh, from home for several months now, as uh, has the rest of our office and. You know, I know we'll get into some of those challenges as we move along, but uh, I, I hope the same for you, Brian, that you're also staying healthy and, and happy as you can. Yeah, it's it seemed like years now, but I think it's only been like four or five <laughs> months, does. something like that. But uh, yeah, we're, we're we're looking forward to uh, you know some return to normalcy someday. But that's right. It's awesome. So so you're a first time guest on the Secure Connections podcast. So so I want to spend a little time getting to know more about you and letting our listeners know more about you and your company. Uh, why don't we start off with your channel career? Give us a little detail. Where'd sure. you come from and, and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, so for a little context, um, actually, this is my second stint with Viper. So uh, I started with Viper in 2010 in, in sales and uh, did that for a few years, I, I loved it, but had an opportunity, a unique opportunity that, that arose for me to uh, to go over to lab tech, um, which most people know obviously um, merged and, and became ConnectWise. So uh, I was uh, given an opportunity to, to go over there and help build out their, their third party security practice and so I did that uh, for a few years. Uh, really loved that time and uh, I ended up coming back to Viper. I guess there's no place like home, right, Brian? So I came back and uh, I had planned and stick in with sales, but actually got poached into the marketing department because of uh, some of my experience with MSPs and, and with that ecosystem. And uh, I, was, I was happy that that was, you know, the kind of uh, inflection point for me in my career. And I, I really enjoyed this role uh, immensely gives me opportunity to, to do engagements like this with you. So, um, you know, that's really the last 10 or so years for me uh, in the channel is, has been in the security space. Great. Yeah, I know uh, from the earlier days of lab tech when they were in Toledo. So I assume that uh, you've been in Clearwater, not in Toledo originally. That's right. Uh, t Toledo is a much different uh, landscape, right? Than, yeah, than it's, it's a beautiful place, Tampa. especially this time of year, but it's not clear water. Yeah, there's, yes. there's a little difference between the two. That's um, right. I say that from the uh, from from the shores of Lake Erie in Pennsylvania. So, uh, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, I'm just on the lake from that. Yeah, so, it, you know, Brian, originally I can relate. Uh, I'm a Michigander originally, um, and, and that kind of never leaves your, your blood. So uh, I've been down here in Florida for quite a while, since 97. Uh, but nonetheless, I do remember those days of the North. Good, good. I won't mention that I lived in Columbus and an Ohio State fan. But we'll oh, leave it okay. At well, we better move on. Yeah, yeah. We'll move on from that point. But <laughs> can you? Uh, what? Why don't you? Can you give us a brief overview? I know, I know a lot of people are familiar with the with the Viper name, um, but I know Viper Security is a lot more comprehensive today than it was even a few years ago. Can you give sure. us uh, give us a little background on on what you guys do sure. in your channel philosophy? Yeah, sure. Viper Security, you know, goes back to 1994. Like we've been talking about, we've been in Clearwater um, that whole time. And you're right. We started out uh, known for our, our sandbox, CW Sandbox, um, and our anti-spyware tool. And that kind of morphed into what we now know as is Viper Antivirus, and then into Viper Endpoint. So we did start in that endpoint security space, and we were happy in that space for quite a while. And Viper, you know, did kind of did so well, frankly, taking a lot of customers and business away from what we call the big three at the time, or the big three security vendors, uh, who became bloated and antiquated. We had a light agent, so so we really had a nice a nice value proposition uh, for for our partners for Viper. Um, as we continued to kind of disrupt that uh, industry, it, it got us a lot of attention, and so there became. 
uh, ownership groups that uh, were looking to add Viper to complete their piece of the, the puzzle, uh, perhaps to go public. Uh, that finally happened for us with J2 Global. So we are a part of J2 Global. We are a public company now. We're part of their cloud services. Um, so we're, we're happy to be part of the J2 family. And like you alluded to, Brian, really what that enabled Viper to do was uh, have much wider breadth of services that we were able to offer uh, with the partnership with J2. For example, we moved from just the endpoint space into email uh, would be, I think, the most prominent examples. Uh, being able to get an email security product out to market. Um, you know, as well, we, we released security awareness training um, just this month. So you know, to your point, I, I'm not used to product cycles like this uh, in marketing. I tell you what, it keeps me busy with all these product releases, but um, I really think it has made Viper a stronger value proposition. Certainly, we can talk about you know, later in the, as we move on, the single sourcing, the advantages that it has in the channel and to, to MSPs, but you know, that's our goal is to is to be that single source for a security stack at least in the big three for network endpoint and email now now in a conversation i remember from last week uh, viper is an, is is an acronym if i remember correctly what, what <laughs> yeah, does it mean yeah that's right yeah a viper is an acronym uh, you can probably tell from the shirt that it's not quite spelled like the traditional viper uh, yeah. but it's virus intrusion prevention remediation engine very cool. Yeah, I think most people just think it's a cool snake. You know, you've got the, the whole Viper. It's not quite the, spelled the same as a car, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. So a little bit of trivia for, for all that's of our right. listeners that, uh, yeah, it means a little different than we thought. So, yeah. so now, Jason, endpoint security is literally a moving target with work from home right now. Um, I think everybody's still in various states of flux is, am I working at home? Am I back in the office? Uh, where might I be tomorrow? How has the shift to remote working, whether temporary or permanent, affected businesses' ability to secure their networks and their data right now? That's a great question. That's the hot button topic, isn't it? Um, you know, kind of a security network admin's nightmare is when everybody goes from under one roof, their roof, to uh, all these individual roofs, and the network just exploded. So, it, you know, it can be worrisome. Uh, to take us, for example, um, you know, Viper as a company, just like just like other businesses, we had to react in March. We had to get our folks working from home. Not everyone had a laptop, you know, so start there. So there was a tremendous opportunity uh, for our channel partners and MSPs right away to start to realize the shift, um, some of the hardware componentry that could be picked up, certainly some of the software uh, that needed to be bolstered in some cases. You know, the, the challenge from working from home is is technology but it's also i think a big part physical physical security because you're now taking a, a pretty private maybe office environment maybe your doors locked things of that nature when you when you leave your office um to suddenly working from home where there's there's maybe children friends uh, you, you just you just never know not that there's nefarious acts that are happened with your close friends and your your kids you know, but the fact remains that these are just best practices. These are muscle memory and habits that users need to get into. And so even though there's things that need to happen on the, the technology side, I think to start with your mind and, and physical security, um, just talking about locking the, the window screen, the system access, um, password protect, uh, separate the work and the, the personal devices, um, that I think that's important as well. But I, I don't know how realistic that is. You know, so, so kind of back to that example, if, if I'm giving someone who never had a laptop before a laptop to take it home and work from home, odds are they're probably going to be commingling their personal and their work activities on that same machine. So from a technology standpoint, you know, for example, Viper has web access control, and that's behooved us in times like these. And the reason being is we can lock down or restrict those machines by group uh, from nine to five, you know, for example, or, or all together. So if, if we say you know, Facebook can never be reached on this machine and, and you can't get around that, it's going to force that person off of that machine uh, onto a personal device. So web access control would be one thing in the technology stack where you could pick up on, uh, you know, a little extra control that you may have lost uh, since the work from home. But another thing I think that's often overlooked is the home router, uh, having to secure the router, make sure that the encryption is turned on, right? The, the WPA2, WPA3 encryption. 
uh, because the idea now of going through your home router, which is pretty insecure, bad guys know that. And uh, so that's one area that, that could be looked at, could be shored up. Make sure to change the router password uh, from default or password or whatever it may be. Um, don't be the low-hanging fruit, as we always say in the security business. You mean Netflix isn't a good password for my home <laughs> router? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, it's, it's probably not probably not the best, Brian, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's not what I use, by the way, just so everybody knows. Just that. so everyone knows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just so everybody knows that. Um, in another case, you know, working from home too, you know, MSPs, I think, truly understand the risks inherent to email communications, but how concerned should they be, especially in the current environment? Well, I think it's cause for real concern. Uh, Brian, the statistics, you know, kind of back that up in terms of, uh, I think the 2020 report that I saw, the Verizon data breach, it was like uh, 25% of businesses, uh, you know, have, have been fished recently. Uh, when you, when you try to tear apart the malware and you find these, the ransomware attacks that occur happen from phishing or spear phishing, which of course comes in through email. And so it's easy to come up with statistics. You know, the, the one I hear most often is over 90% of ransomware attacks come in from email, from phishing. So it's kind of that, that process, right, or business email compromise. And I think that it can't be overlooked. Um, this is where most of the malware uh, authors and bad guys are spending their time these days because it's a, it's a one-to-many approach. It's an easy approach. Um, a simple analogy would be, you know, if, if the uh, baseball, if the big leagues in the minor leagues, well, you, you can do pretty well in the minor leagues if you're a hacker and, and all you want to do is send out phishing campaigns. I mean, that's, you're going to be pretty successful and you haven't maybe joined the big leagues yet where you're maybe part of a international hacking organization and it's state sponsored and you're going after the whales. We're talking the ransomware attacks that we see on cities, municipalities, businesses for millions of dollars. You know, I think that's the big leagues, but certainly when you roll it back and you talk about ransomware as a service, that's really had an effect on just people like me being able to go out to the dark web, grab ransomware as a service, and really I'm off and running immediately with uh, malware campaigns that will be delivered via email. Yeah. And the email system is kind of, somebody compared it uh, recently I was talking to, to the screen door. Is, mm -hmm. is, yeah, you're filtering out the known um, spam, the known viruses, that, but it is so dynamic as far as creating campaigns that can get through email today. And you can't blame it on an email security app. The, the, the cyber criminals are so fast That's and right. so quick at adapting that users have to have you know some input. But, but what can MSPs best do, or how can they best attack the problem to minimize their clients' sure. exposure today? What are your recommendations? Well, my recommendation would be the, the layered security approach. Uh, you know, the, the network's always been known, right? We've got to have the mm -hmm. next-gen firewall. We've got to take care of the network. We know we need endpoint. Um, we've got to take care of endpoints. But I, I would say that that other vector, that large attack services, uh, attack surface, rather, of email is critical to the layered security approach. You, you mentioned the screen door. I think that's perfect analogy. You know, I remember when it was good enough to have anti-spam and, and just basic protection in your endpoint. So when you're reading the data sheets to the endpoints, you know, it says, oh, email security is in here. Well, what the heck do I need to secure my email for when I'm getting it from my endpoint? To your point, Brian, that used to be good enough, but it's not anymore. It's not anymore in this cat and mouse game that's occurring between the, the good guys and the bad guys. And so it's this evolving game that we're playing, this cat and mouse game. So we know that, okay, email security is something that needs to stand on its own. And there became the email security products out to the market that, that we're familiar with. Um, you, know, we, you and I have chatted before in, in kind of offline about um, Office 365 in the cloud and how that's made everything so much easier, particularly in the COVID environment and the work from home environment. Sure. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that. But when you look at uh, Microsoft, there's a, there's a couple of problems that I see with Office 365 with regards to security. That is, first of all, it's the biggest target. So that's where if I'm, again, if I'm going to get my feet wet and cut my teeth in the, in the malware game, I'm probably going to get the exploit kit where I have the biggest target, and that's O365. So I can go and I can get that kit today. Not a problem. 
and what I mean by that is obviously the exploit kit is written to get past the initial security parameters of the basic Office 365. Microsoft knows this. It's, it's not a secret, Brian, because if, yeah. and like many of the MSPs know, there's different levels of O365. And what I would say my recommendation is, is to make sure that if you're just on that basic level, uh, E1, that that's probably not, well, let me take that back. That's not going to be enough protection in terms of advanced threat protection. And what I mean by Microsoft knows it's not enough protection, all you have to do is look at their E5 package. And their E5 package, now they've added in ATP, or advanced threat protection. If you pay so more, you, yeah, we'll, if you we'll pay cover more, it. Yeah, right. yeah. But what I thought was interesting about that is if you really inherently look at that and you kind of critically think about it, you said, well, Microsoft just told me by virtue of their own product that their basic package isn't good enough security. Well, the, the problem is, Brian, when you try to go up and to grab E5 or E3, you're getting a lot of other business applications with it that you might not need and the cost skyrockets. Right. 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 So I think the, the quick analysis is if I don't need any of these other business applications and all I'm doing is trying to get the necessary ATP, I think folks or MSPs are better off with that basic service and supplementing their security with a third party email cloud product. Yeah, because they, they create the, the misperception, I, I think, is A, you talk about the standard package, is how do you overcome the, the MSP's client's illusion that the native security system is enough, is good enough? I mean, you've, you've given a good example is because you can point to the fact that their higher level one has much better security. <laughs> that's that, right. That, that's a good point to think about. But the other part is, you know, with some, you've, you've, if they don't think they need more. They're mm -hmm. perfectly happy with that, even though the MSPs know uh, they're not comfortable with their clients having just the base package. So uh, I, I guess what are your other thoughts on those conversations of getting them to uh, to buy into using Viper or something else? Uh, well, to it's a them? good point. I mean, the really the statistics, all, all of the, uh, the news that's out there is in the MSPs corner. Yeah, you know, we don't have to prove this large proof of concept that this is happening. This is happening. Mm -hmm. So there's a hefty dose of, of FUD or fear, uncertainty, and doubt that um, is probably warranted in this case to be woven into that pitch. I'm, I would never suggest that scare tactics is the way to go, but it's warranted. These are where the attacks are coming in. And if I'm the MSP, I'm the guy this, that you're looking to, um, guy or gal. Listen, you've got to take care of email security. Um, it's it's critical. I, I think it's to the point where you you have to wonder if certain clients, depending on on what they purchase, is is worth it. You know, there's a notion of having these high risk clients. They won't upgrade. They won't get to the latest engine. They won't protect their email, and you're in charge of their security. So at some point, um, I think some of those lemmings might have to to, to go off the cliff. Um, and there is that notion, but I know that's easier said than done. So I, I think just to stick to the basics, the layer security approach, stick to um, Microsoft's own narrative, their own materials. Um, like you said, Brian, don't take it from me, the MSP or the vendor. Microsoft themselves are, are saying this isn't enough security. Yeah, and I, I think there's some also some credence to the fact that Microsoft is not a security company. They're very good at what they Great do. Point but they're generalists. If you think about it, the generalists as opposed to the MSP being able to take their own preferred tools that they know are looking at all of these other issues. When Microsoft does, comes to the game, they're usually much later than the security companies would be to address the issues that Microsoft created themselves or people find Great point. Yeah. You know, that's a really good point. I remember when I was selling Endpoint for Viper, like I mentioned, and I would get asked you know, quite often, isn't Windows Defender good enough? Uh, you know, and a, a decade ago, folks were, were really thinking, I'm just going to run with this. And uh, so it's, it's kind of that, that same idea, isn't it? That I used to say, if you're going to use Windows Defender, that is the definition of the fox watching the hen house. Um, the reason that we need antivirus is because of Microsoft, but yet you're going to use a Microsoft antivirus tool to protect itself. Kind of weird. Yeah, and usually, you know, a couple steps behind what everybody else is already doing on security when they get to that point. And I think I'm being generous saying a couple. But uh, yeah, so so we've talked about some individual parts. Let's talk about the platform security mm -hmm. approach. Um, what are the must-have tools for today's security-minded MSPs, and how does Viper address those needs? Let's let's dig into your tool set. What you have available. 
Yeah, so from the Viper tool set that, you know, I, I think I lightly touched on our value proposition earlier that um, it's a portfolio of protection from Viper that's going to allow MSPs to put together that security platform in an in attempt to reduce the tool sprawl, the source sprawl, and, and to try to aim towards reduced sourcing. Um, so with that, uh, we do have a threat, a couple of threat tools for uh, threat analytics or threat analyzer, uh, as well as a, a threat IQ feed. So we have those advanced threat capabilities, but for the bedrock, we, we have what you would typically start to build your security practice out from, and that is uh, the endpoint. So of course, Viper Endpoint Cloud. Um, we've just released version 12, and we've completely redone our engine there. Uh, for folks that have seen us before, I would, I would say to look at us again, we've added um, DNS filtering. Uh, and at no charge, which is a diversion from the rest of the industry. So we, we want to give the MSPs out there the feature sets and let them charge for the billable services without socking them for the billable services. So if we can give them web access control and DNS, we know that they can go out there and sell those as additional services. So I guess my point is when we're, when we're building out the security platform, we have in mind to layer each platform with a variety of billable services for the MSPs and, and for our channel partners. That's particularly acute in our email security. Um, so our email security suite has the basic email security, which is gonna give you the screen door, as you so aptly put it. It's gonna get rid of the gray mail, the bulk mail, the, the most of those general you know, attempts. But that's not good enough. Um, today, what's happening is the malware author, authors are relying on bad URLs very heavily. And because the bad URLs go into the business email compromise and the phishing campaigns, it always culminates with, this is the boss, click here. Or this is Amazon, you have a package delivered, click here. This is Facebook, change your password, click here. You get the idea. Usually the call to action from these bad guys is to click here. And so I would encourage the MSPs to make sure when they do go with an email security product that they make sure that it has that URL phishing protection to start with. I think that's the most important thing. Um, Viper, uh, if I could plug Viper's email, what, what I like about one of our features is we have click time protection. And so what happens is when these malware authors create these campaigns, they will weaponize that link. They'll send it out to hundreds or thousands of folks and they'll keep that, or I'm sorry, they, they keep the link, a, a safe link, right? And they'll send that out to thousands of people and then they will weaponize the link a couple hours, three, four hours after that blast has gone out. So what happens is the email security doesn't stop it coming in because the link's good. It mm -hmm. looked at the link, but the link was legit. Now it rests in your inbox. What happens when the average person goes back tomorrow, checks that, says, hey, Bob, check this out. Look, we'll click here. Well, that link has been weaponized. You need a product that's going to have click time protection that looks back at that link, even though it's been through the email security. Yeah. Uh, it, it still needs to look at this. So click time protection, I think, is a big key within the URL protection. And then, uh, Brian, I would also add attachment protection. And that's usually the cornerstone of ATP or advanced threat protection is going to be your, your, uh, your basic email filtering, mm -hmm. your URL protection, and your attachment filtering for really Microsoft documents, macros, uh, the malware that authors will write in the attachments. Yeah, I, I hadn't actually heard of the uh, the last attack you talked about. It sounds like a delayed Trojan type of attack where you uh, you sneak it in the door and then you activate it. Maybe it's a term that, the Terminator approach maybe. The is, Terminator. Is Isn't Terminator. that the case yeah. these days though where malware authors, the bad guys, they are going in, they're living they're off smart. the land, they're, they're, they're getting into the network and they're just biding their time, live off the land, and wait until the time is right to either exfiltrate, ransom, or, or what have you. They're specialists. They spend all their time thinking of these things. That's, that's what they do for a living, I suppose. All you got to do is look at human behavior. And, and I've heard many of them are looking at, you know, psychologists and others, human behavior. They're studying where do people screw up and how can we take advantage of that? And that's, that's right. Yeah, that's no matter how good, you know, your tools can be, you've got to be thinking the same way. And that, well, that's not easy to do. Well, I think that you're right. And phishing was bad enough. It was already widespread. It was already common. It got worse when the pandemic started because, yeah. of course, these authors look for the most uh, topical 
um, thing they can. That's a big part of this urgency. You know, COVID results in your zip code, click here. It, it, it's so easy. Uh, but I guess the challenge though is that it has increased. We know that the numbers have increased um, since COVID. And then for the folks in the MSPs are listening saying, well, come on guys, like I, how hard could it be to kind of condition somebody to look for these these emails that have stuff spelled wrong and uh, looks real janky and, and fake. And these aren't from the prince of Nigeria anymore, right? These are legitimate uh, business looking emails that uh, will fool even security folks like myself if, if they're good enough. So the point is that some phishing emails obviously look fake, but really not the campaigns that are effective and that we're, that we're seeing today be successful. Those are very real looking. Um, so I guess what I would, would kind of end with, and I kind of always culminate with my bottom line advice for phishing is it's a combination of technology and user training. That's why security awareness training and email security are such popular products right now. Right. because that is the exact intersection where we need to say, look, technology can't do it all. It's unfair to say that the user can do it all. So we need that mix. Yeah, that makes sense. What, what do you see, what comes next, Jason? We, we've, you know, you've got all of these things available now and I, I think the you know, MSPs have a lot of tools at their disposal uh, right now, including the cybersecurity training, which I think is essential, uh, should be standard with any client, but, um, What's on the horizon? What do, what do we see as, uh, as the next big thing that MSPs need to be aware of? That's a great, that's a great question. I was you know, thinking, wouldn't it be great if I could tell MSPs what the next big thing is to look out for? Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't seem like that's the way that the security business works. It seems yeah. like we react uh, to this cat and mouse game. The hackers find a new exploit, a new path, a new technique, and we react to that technique. It's, it's difficult to... to uh, hypothesize what they might come up with. But the one thing that I'm, I'm seeing that's worrisome is the combination of this really toxic man. I've heard of this, unfortunately. Uh, so Dino Kitty, also known as Revil ransomware, is uh, very prevalent right now, and it's really tricky uh, malware. And it, in and of itself, I think what the, the to your question, Brian, let me back up to your question. What does the future hold? It's going to be this modular componentry malware with many different steps into the, the process. So maybe it's an email campaign to get out the bad links, which either puts a dropper down, does something with the malware, exfiltrates data. But there's going to be a combination of these malwares. It's not going to be as easy as it used to be to lock down your attack vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's what worries me are the particularly the state actors and the big leagues, like I mentioned before, are getting really good at ob obfuscating their their packages, and it's it's really sophisticated malware. Right. I mean, at first it was they get the language right, or they're getting the language right. They still get some occasional ones that are pretty bad, but, but uh, they, they make the logo and the look of emails look proper when they're coming mm -hmm. in, and now, you know, they can disguise the links that with artificial intelligence and other things coming along, this is it's going to be harder and harder, I would think, to uh, to, to protect the threats against businesses. So I think you're right. I think you're a, right. It's 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 a big challenge for uh, for MSPs, uh, but it's one that can be met. Um, there are enough, I think, tools on the market to start to get a good feel for you know taking care of the MSP first, right? Having your core security taken care of and then being able to kind of be the, the security MSP that, that you'd like to be. But it used to be, Brian, that it, a security MSP wouldn't have to necessarily make sure that their own network was just ironclad, locked down. We know that the malware authors now are just going straight for the MSPs, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. so why would I go to a one-to-one -one approach? You know, if I'm gonna try to hack you know, uh, ABC manufacturing, that's one to one. I'm just going to go to MSPs and I'm going to go one to many. Exactly. All I have to do is get in his network and I've got his whole book of business. And that, that's what was so troublesome with the, the large, you know, the big four kind of PSA RMMs, as we all uh, well know, have had some security struggles in the past 24 to 36 months. And it isn't just one of those companies, it was everybody had to kind of react and, and lock the security down better. Uh, you know, but it is, it is a big challenge. And I think the notion where 
an MSP could just kind of have endpoint and a firewall and then go out and tell people that they need to buy all this different security that they themselves don't use. I think those days are probably over. Yeah. Uh, we're back to eating your own dog food. The other term that I hear frequently is drinking your own champagne. I guess people don't like to think about eating dog food, but uh, they don't like that. No, I know people yeah. that that hate yeah. that saying. They cringe, but, it's but just you know one what? Those they get, old ones but, that I but they get the point. Right. Yeah, they it sticks the with them better. You know, drink champagne sounds too fun. Yeah, that's too enjoyable. You got you got to you got to take yeah, some hard knocks when you that do. sounds kind of nice. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the advantage though of being able to do this as a service is yeah. uh, the MSPs don't have to take on shelfware. Yeah. You know, they can kind of do it as they need it, they can take it on as they need it. So we're really not asking MSPs in the security space to take on all this inventory or anything like that. Um, really, I think it's to your first question uh, early on was, well, how do the MSPs convince their clients who are fat and happy um, that that may not last forever if they're if they continue down the same security posture that they have today. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, well, as we start to wind down, uh, I've got one more uh, big question for you. Uh, listeners can learn more about Viper Security on the IOTSA Security Solutions Showcase page at, at IOTSA.com, but what should they know about your partner program? Uh, great question. We have a, a really robust partner program. Uh, they can operate in our partner portal autonomously, uh, you know, for fulfillment and quoting, all the marketing materials, everything they need. Of course, we have uh, killer margins, deal reg. Um, we have free trials of all our products, right? So try before you buy. Uh, we have a lot of experience in the channel uh, within Viper. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of our channel program and particularly uh, how we work with our MSPs. So I would say, uh, you know, get a hold of me, or um, just go to Viper.com, uh, go to the MSP page that we have, look at our solutions, and take a free trial and see what you think. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, the last thing is any parting uh, knowledge you'd like to share with us before we sign off today, Jason? No, we, we've talked a lot about you know fishing. I would say just to be diligent in these times, uh, work from home, COVID. Um, it's tax season. I think today's the the last day for taxes. So I would say, you know, just be cognizant of, of the phishing scams that are out there. Um, you know, th that's really, I think my, my parting advice, I know that it's maybe not as prescriptive as I'd like it to be. Um, but I would say pay attention to your emails, be cognizant of these, of these, uh, scams. We didn't get a chance to really talk about DLP. So we'll have to talk about that another day. But, um, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for growth in the security practice when you start to open it up to uh, DLP solutions, email security, endpoint. Yeah, fantastic. No, I'd love to love to talk about DLP. We'll catch back up with you shortly Sounds on that good. and uh, and do a follow up. But uh, Perfect. Fant fantastic information. On, on behalf of IOTSA, I'd like to thank Jason Norton from Viper Security for joining us today. Uh, be sure to check back each week for the next edition of the Secure Connections podcast. It's IOTSA.com, I-O-T-S-S-A. Be safe and have a fantastic day.